<laughs> well, it ain't much, but it's honest work. First walleye of the 21-22 hard water season. Had a little road trip, got set up right at dusk. Up probably a little shallower than we should be, but our game plan was late start. Stay out here until we stop hearing people walk in, so. Skinny water should get better the darker it gets. Felt so good, first one of the season. The next melning. And he's fading away into the abyss. That would have been really nice if he would have cooperated. So we've all been there. Walleyes are walleyes and they're fussy. And I don't even care if you're on a walleye factory, like we're on Upper Red Lake today. People were crushing them last weekend. And every day after that, it got a little tougher, a little slower, a little slower. And that's kind of one of those things about chasing the hot bite, right? It's like a one or two day thing. And usually by the time you can uh, coordinate your schedule and get to that hot bite, it fades away. So even on a factory where you think up Red Lake, I'm gonna catch 20 or 30 walleyes, doesn't matter where I sit, what I use, not true. Like reality is today, yesterday, catch four, five, six walleyes and it's a success. And so there's a few different options you have. If you show up on a trip, and it's just a dead sea, tough bite. Some of them are easy options. Some of them are a lot of work. <laughs> and you can kind of choose what suits you best. So I would say the option that would give you the best success would be making big, big moves when you're on a lake like Upper Red Lake. It's kind of like the Lake Winnipeg factor where if you're not marking fish, not graphing fish, you make big quarter mile, half mile moves because you're more so looking for areas with pods of fish working bait as opposed to fishing structure and setting up on like a high percentage spot. These are big kind of bowl lakes with less structure than others, really gradual breaks. We're a mile offshore right now and it's still only 10 feet deep, if that tells you anything. So making those big quarter mile jumps, fishing for 15, 20 minutes max, and if you don't graph a walleye out of your group, make another quarter mile move or whatever it is until you start seeing some fish and then you tighten up your jumps and your moves. So that's obviously the most strenuous way to try to combat a tough bite. The next option, what most people probably do, is uh, sit and stay and try to hopefully, maybe, possibly make them pay, right? You're setting up shop, you gotta have a dead stick down, maybe a jig and spoon or rip and wraps, try to call fish in. And uh, when the bite is just off and funky, you might not even want those rattles down there. Um, but you're sitting there trying to get away from people, quiet and just waiting to take your shot. It might be an hour and then all of a sudden you got a fish come through and you need to, to capitalize on it. But <laughs> that was embarrassing. Laying on my back, thinking about taking a little snooze. Taking advantage of your two lines or however many you can fish, spreading them out and grinding out a tough bite. And the, the kind of third option, which is something that we do back home and what saved our trip uh, today and last night is hitting the flash bite. And it's so funny that flash bite walleyes are basically all we have where I'm at in Brainerd. You got a 30 to 40 minute window at sunrise and sunset where you have maybe three, four, five opportunities to catch a walleye. Marks that come through on the graph and they're crazy aggressive. But before that window, all day, after that window, all night, you're just not gonna catch any fish. So you, <laughs> you adjust your schedule to be at the lake, at the spot, ready to fish for that 30, 40 minute window right at sunset until dark. And even on a walleye factory like Upper Red Lake, that saved our trip yesterday. We uh, we knew we were kind of crunched for time, so we only set up 0.3 miles from shore. It was about 6.7 to 7.4 feet deep, and way, you know, maybe even a quarter mile in from a lot of the houses, but much shallower, and we knew that we weren't gonna see much for that 30, 40 minutes until dark, just because we were so up shallow tight. But we were just making sure we had all of our holes drilled, everything set up to capitalize at sunset, and sure enough, even on Upper Red Lake, we had five or six fish come through in a 25 minute window. Caught four or five of them. I had to turn on the old lightsaber. <laughs> so sweet watching that thing just slowly sink. It's all wrapped up. 
but it is definitely paying off for us to stay out. Well, you can hear all the foot traffic. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Heading back in. I haven't done this in like six months, so just cut me some slack here. <laughs> all right. Thanks, buddy. I love it. It's like when you're fishing on a lake in Brainerd and it's a Sunday and you can hear the traffic on 371 heading south. Just hearing all the foot traffic and sleds heading in. Gotta get while the getting's good. You know, I don't think it matters as much on the flash bites, what you're using. Um, other than I did like having a glow bait because it's lower light, dirtier water, and uh, this tumbler spoon in that glow tiger color just worked really well. It's got a little flasher on there. You can make it kind of noisy and make it have a lot of action, or you can fish it really slow and kind of dummy proof, slow down. So it's kind of a hybrid of, of those tingler spoons, those flutter spoons, and the rattle spoons. But like I said, in those flash bite windows, when those fish are just hot to trot and they come flying in, I'm not sure if it really would make a difference what you had on. The biggest thing is you have to be ready and set up and quiet and capitalize on every fish that comes in. I briefly mentioned dead sticks before, but no matter which of those options you're doing, the run and gun, the sit and stay, or the flash bite window, you have to have that dead stick out on tough bites to just double your odds. That little do nothing bait down on bottom when the bite is tough and fish are negative, sometimes that's that's gonna catch all of your fish that day. You might maybe get a bonus one or two jigging, but that flag popping or that dead stick or bobber going down is, is gonna save your trip. And it's so simple, just a small split shot. And I usually do a tiny treble hook. And uh, what I'll do on tough bites, slide that split shot down closer to the hook. Instead of having it 12 or 18 inches above, I tighten it down and it's basically a pivot point so that that minnow isn't swimming way out off to the side. If you've only got a six inch drop or so, it's very limited in how far it can move. And when those fish are just kind of neutral, negative, sliding in tight to bottom and not actively chasing, there's times where we watch them on the graph, the live scope, the flasher, you see that minnow start swimming away from the fish and the fish is like, nope, neutral, turn around, I'm out of here. But when it can't get away and it's just sitting there shimmying, they commit and, uh, I just run six pound mono on my dead sticks because your braided line is gonna absorb moisture, freeze up, especially a dead stick that's just sitting there for an hour in between bites. So six pound advanced mono is, is kind of all around. And actually that's the same thing I'm using when I'm hole hopping, bouncing around with jigging spoons as well, just because of the freeze factor and you lose less fish. Typically I'm gonna be setting my dead sticks tighter to bottom six inches a foot is kind of high but when the bite is really tough i want to be within that bottom 12 inches of those lower active fish that are just the bottom suckers right and even then I'll, when i'm fishing my jigging spoons i'll try to stay two three feet off higher up fish can see that from farther away if you're sitting there trying to wait for fish to come to you i mean imagine looking at the horizon if there's a plane up ahead you're not even looking in that direction and you're gonna go, what's that? Oh, it's a plane. But if it was flying at the tree line, you probably wouldn't spot it out of the corner of your eye. Kind of similar idea for just fishing a little higher off bottom, two, three feet. But at the same time, you got that dead stick laying low. So they come in, they'll usually slide off and hit that dead stick. Man, last year when we were up here, it was same time, same conditions, same everything. And they were just crushing a rap or rip and rap big aggressive sweeps or whatever and just donk. And I think I was even using a number six, like pretty big for central and northern Minnesota. We don't live in Manitoba, <laughs> but it's so funny how different the bike can be day to day or year to year or whatever, even 24 hours later, same conditions and having to completely switch up what you're doing. I was all giddy when I got out here and started with the rip and wrap and I did have one come up and swat at it, but it didn't engulf it like they did last year where it was like, I think I'm gonna need a pliers to get this out. So I immediately switched to the tumbler spoon, a little bit quieter, a little bit more subtle, and uh, popped a few fish on that, but I'm missing those rip and wrap eyes. <laughs> I've got the weird chin hood ninja thing going. <laughs> so walleyes are walleyes. It doesn't matter where you're at in the wallet world, 
they can be so frustrating but I think that's kind of one of the things that I like about them so much is it's so rewarding when the stars align and you pop those fish and it's it it reminds me of talking to musky dudes right where I'll go out and fish all day or hit the evening bite and just pop in that one fat mark that slides in and you get them to raise up on the flasher it's like I could go home right now and be happy there's just something to be said about it but you just gotta remember Walleyes or walleyes. Whether you're on a walleye factory, like Upper Red Lake, like we're on, doesn't matter. They can still get fussy, they can still turn off, and they can be a challenge, but capitalize on those bites and make the most of it. I started losing it because there was a mark on the graph, but I think it's just a perch. I can't talk when there's a mark on my graph. It's a real situation. There's probably like a nine pound largemouth in here. Let's go find some largemouth.